Harichka, Harichka. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And then I say, uh, well, which means good day and welcome in my language. My name is Len Pierre. My ancestral name is Palikuluk. And I am Coast Salish from Keitsi First Nation on my father's side and Musqueam First Nation on my mother's side, uh, which is one of our host territories on which we are gathered here today. I am a consultant for my own consulting practice at Len Pierre Consulting, um, where we specialize in topics and conversations for decolonization, reconciliation, and Indigenous cultural safety and humility for any willing service provider or professional corporate organization in North America. Um, I come to you this evening with an open heart and an open mind. Um, I've been asked to share just a little bit of knowledge and hold a little bit of space for um, National Indigenous Peoples Day. Now, I'll be very transparent with you. <laughs> I always say transparency is kind of like my corporate superpower. I can't really turn it off. Um, and it's, it's, it's called upon me to be able to be transparent, to be able to do this work. Um, but I've been asked to share just a little bit of what I know for what, it mean, what Indigenous Peoples Day means in the context of Canada. More importantly, what does National Indigenous Peoples Day mean uh, for event planners? Um, so I want to say thank you for being here this evening, for listening, learning, and leaning into uh, this conversation. And I really want to emphasize that I would love this to be a conversation. Uh, so I invite each and every one of you wholeheartedly. I said I come to you with an open heart and an open mind, and I hope to be received in the same way. Um, and so I invite you, invite you to participate in this discussion. Um, my favorite thing as a teacher and an educator, a facilitator and a speaker, is you know, to have good questions and good dialogue. Uh, Dr. Chief Robert Joseph says, through dialogue, we generate understanding. Through dialogue, we can uh, achieve reconciliation. And so I invite you, this is your safe space. These are your peeps. These are, these are your, your uh, teams and your comrades, right? Uh, I am a guest and a visitor in your circle here for ILEA, right? Uh, so this is your safe space. Uh, so I invite you to participate in that safe space because in a time of truth and reconciliation, in a time of decolonization, and asking ourselves what we can do to reconcile and what we can do to build relationships with indigenous peoples, initiatives, we have to participate, right? And so I invite you to participate this evening by asking your good question. I'll be very transparent, there's no such thing as a silly question, and I've heard all of them, so I invite you wholeheartedly <laughs> to bring them into this space, right? Because if you ask it, you're gonna have, look around the room, there's gonna be three other people like, oh, thank God they asked it. <laughs> so I invite you to. Uh, this is your safe space for the purposes of learning. There's no such thing as a silly question. Um, and when I hold the space, you know, I really want to emphasize that it's not just enough to have safe spaces. We also need to have brave spaces for this conversation too, right? Any Brene Brown fans in the space here? <laughs> Brene Browns? Yes, 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 yes. Right? What are the, what, what is Brene Brown t famous for? What does she teach, right? The power of vulnerability, mm. right? And I'm just going to be very transparent with you. <laughs> I'm going to say transparency like numerous times throughout this talk. Uh, to have these conversations, right? We cannot talk about National Indigenous Peoples Day without talking about reconciliation. And we cannot talk about National Indigenous Peoples Day without talking about intergenerational trauma or colonialism or systemic racism against Indigenous folks. They are not the easiest conversations to have. I know I do it for a living. I'm already starting to sweat. <laughs> Because uh, I'm, I'm nervous and I'm vulnerable too, right? And so it's not just you, it's us. We're in this together, right? So let's be in that together, right? Brene Brown says, you know, when we can sit in our vulnerability long enough to be human with each other, right? Even if shame comes up, that's okay. That's where all the magic happens for this conversation. So with that, I invite you to be here wholeheartedly. Um, <clears throat> on the topic of, you know, how can we mobilize, how can we reflect uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day into our professional practice. We're all professionals, right? Um, how can we reflect National Indigenous Peoples Day? Um, first, I think it's understanding where National Indigenous Peoples Day comes from. Why is it on June 21st every single year here in Canada? The reason for having National Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st of every month is summer solstice. It is the longest day of the year. And in many indigenous communities and cultures across Turtle Island, also known as North America, um, that was our new year, 
right? It was the time for renewal and a time for rebirth. It was often for many of our cultures where the salmon run really started to kind of come in. So it was the happiest time of year, and especially here in Coast Salish territory. Um, because if you can imagine, are, are we all international? How many are Vancou local to Vancouver here? There, almost everybody, almost everybody, yeah. So you know here, <laughs> it's like quite chilly out, right? It's quite cold out and it's springtime. But imagine trying to survive these elements a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago, right? Um, the food was less abundant. And so we would have to live on food storages and um, game throughout the winter season. Then when the salmon run started to come around again, there was all of a sudden abundance that was returning to our territories. So it was a beautiful time for celebration and renewal and just, it was like happy, right? Everybody's so happy because there's so much wealth, so much abundance that was coming through into the community. So that was our new year. There was a lot to celebrate. There's a lot to be grateful for. So when it came a time to picking a day for celebrating Indigenous people's heritage, we're like, summer solstice, right? So when you celebrate National Indigenous People's Day, you're celebrating something that we've been celebrating for a long, long, long time. I would just go say as far as uh, the beginning of time. In our culture, we say time immemorial, right? So when you're celebrating something, you're not celebrating a new holiday, right? That new holiday <laughs> is older than Canada. <laughs> now, COVID has really thrown me through a time loophole. I always forget what year it is, <laughs> and I also forget what, how old I am. <laughs> Uh, but I can't remember how old Canada is. Does anybody know how old Canada is? 154 years old. I think so. Yeah, 154 years old. Um, does anybody know how old our Coast Salish territories are? Way older than that. Way older. <laughs> yes. My cousin Spencer's like... <laughs> Do you want to say? 14,000. 14,000, right? So next to Canada, right? Um, our communities, our Coast Salish nations here in downtown Vancouver, right, throughout the lower mainland here, um, our sister nations, I call them, we're all cousins, all sister nations, right, we're ancient, we're old, we've seen a lot of things. <laughs> Canada is just an infant, hours old, if not minutes old, next to the ancientness of our communities, right? And what a beautiful thing that can be, right, if you partake and participate in National Indigenous Peoples Day, what a celebration that is, right? Because you don't have to. Right? Nobody's forcing you to go out there and go to a powwow or to attend a community event or attend uh, you know, canoe races. But when you do, and you can imagine for a moment while you're participating, what a beautiful moment that is, right? And I say it is a beautiful moment because, I don't know if everybody in the space here knows it, but it used to be illegal for us to practice it once upon a time, right? It used to be illegal for us to practice our culture. It used to be illegal for us to speak our language, to sing our songs, to dance our dances. And I get it, we love seeing each other after two years of you know, social gathering restrictions, right? A lot of Canadians think that's the first time that's happened in this country. And I'm like, <laughs> that is not the first time social distancing and physical gathering restrictions have happened in this country. Through the anti-potlatch ban in the late 1800s, it was illegal for us to gather in numbers greater than six or more as indigenous peoples. Right? And we're tired after two years. The anti potlatch ban was in effect for over 50 years. So we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. Um, so how beautiful is it whenever you hear a territorial acknowledgement or if you ever hear an elder stand up and welcome you to the territory or if you ever hear a, dr a drumming song or you see a beautiful fancy dancer Right? And everybody goes, oh, that's so beautiful. That's so wonderful. And imagine how graciously and generously that culture shared with you today. When for over 50 years in this country, it was illegal for us to do so. It was so illegal for us to practice our culture, it was illegal for us to hang curtains over our living room and front room windows. Blankets for that matter too. Because if we did, right, uh, our, our reserve systems used to be policed by, um, what do we call them? Indian agents. Indian agents, right? If we covered our, cur if our curtains were closed, right? It meant that the Indian agents couldn't come peek in the window and see, oh, those Indians are gathering. Throw them in jail, right? And so I always say, we all need to know about the potlatch bat because with the next time you see, hear an elder speak, the next time you hear the traditional uh, territorial acknowledgement, the next time you hear a song, uh, see a dance, you're not going to appreciate it 
the way you would if you didn't know what I had to go through to be here today. So when you participate in National Indigenous Peoples Day celebrations and heritage and culture, if you're ever invited to those things and you feel it fill your cup, if you feel that sense of joy, if you feel that sense of gratitude and appreciation for it, right? What you're doing is you're celebrating Indigenous resistance because it's live here for a reason. It went underground, right? People tried to beat the culture out of us, but we we're tricky and sneaky enough and we just made it go underground to be here today. Right? But it's also a celebration of our resistance, resilience, and resurgence. Right? I like to talk about the 21st century in terms of Indigenous arts and culture as the, our new renaissance. Right? We're in our new renaissance. And that's full credit to Indigenous folks. <laughs> and when you participate in that, you celebrate that. You uphold it. You congratulate it. Right? And that is one of the most beautiful manifestations of reconciliation that you can do in your professional practice. So that's the way I look at reconciliation. When I look at reconciliation, a lot of people think it's like a government kind of thing. It's like, well, the government's taking care of it for us, right? <laughs> they got it. Municipalities, province, federal government. The way I like to look at reconciliation is a relationship, right? It's a relationship. It's less of a political task or a political check mark. It's more of an in uh, investment in a relationship. You can invest in a relationship with indigenous peoples, with indigenous content and with indigenous initiatives. And for you, in the places you hold as event planners, you have access to people, you have access to um, initiatives, right? And if you don't have access to initiatives, you can create your own. How many of you sit in meetings where you're attending policies or programming or event planning, right? You have access to create ideas that have never been created before, right? The power you have to create is really incredible. So you can create those spots. You can create those moments of opportunity to take with you. Say, I think we need to bring an elder in for this event to do a territorial welcome. Or to do a territorial welcome, but please don't invite an elder to do a land acknowledgement. Because <laughs> um, that belongs to the person, the host. Uh, for all event planners, tip, trick, tool, strategy, you can put it in your tool belt, <laughs> is to give the land acknowledgement to the highest uh, senior position in the room. That's their job, right? who's the CEO, who's the manager, who's the director, who's the MC, they should be doing the territory acknowledgement. And for people, when you hear territory acknowledgement, land acknowledgement, I always say, you can retire the land acknowledgement because are you really acknowledging the land? Less so the land, what you're really acknowledging is somebody's relationship to the land. And so when you say territory acknowledgement, you're talking about somebody's relationship to the land, right? So I say territory acknowledgement over land acknowledgement, and always make sure that as event planners, your highest senior position, the leader of your house, the leader of the whoever's the host is, should be doing the territorial acknowledgement. But definitely, you're in that place and that capacity to invest in relationships. Bring in a local chief, local elder, local community uh, representative to do the traditional welcome. Because that's a part of our history and culture that goes back centuries too. Is that if we ever had a gathering on our nation and our lands and our territories, uh, some of our more senior leaders, elders, representatives would come and welcome you to our territories, right? So again, you're practicing in something that's much more ancient than, than Canada. So that's how I would look at that. And I offer those as tools, tips, tricks, and strategies. On the topic of territory acknowledgements, uh, because so many of us are familiar with territory acknowledgements here in Coast Salish territory, right? And specific to uh, Vancouver. Um, one of the things I like to recognize when we do the territory acknowledgement is a lot of people, because I, I talk about this for a living, built a career out of it, accidental I say, because um, I never planned this. <laughs> I did not come up with this plan in grade 10 when careers department, when they're like, <laughs> I want to talk about territorial recognitions and anti-racist work. <laughs> to me, they didn't have those kind of jobs in high school. <laughs> um, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> territory acknowledgements. Um, I get a lot of questions about Usually people ask me, especially professionals, especially event planners, they say, Len, we've been doing the territory acknowledgement for a couple years now, and we kind of feel like it's borderline tokenistic, borderline superficial, borderline performative. And I'm like, that's okay. That's really valid. Absolutely. I validate that, right? And you're not the only one, because there's hundreds of organizations who have told me that across Canada in the last two years. But it doesn't have to be. Um, when you do the territory acknowledgement, I say there's this like slideable scale for how you can do a territory acknowledgement. 
the normal territory acknowledgement is what's written in your script, approved by your organization and with the include, in, inclusion of those land-based nations say, yep, yeah, you got it right. Um, but then you can progress out of a standard recognition into what I call a reflective territorial recognition. A reflective territorial recognition looks like where you're using a lot of I statements in your territory acknowledgement. So you're starting to own your territory acknowledgement. So that looks like when you're saying things like, I have learned, I am committed, I am reflecting on my position in reconciliation, my responsibility to reconciliation, and then you add in your pieces. So what you're doing is you're role modeling to everybody who's listening to you in the space that you can mobilize reconciliation, you can mobilize cultural safety, you can mobilize the celebration of indigenous people and voices and their resiliency and strength. Um, so that's step two, and there's only three steps. The third step, the, th the magic phase I always say, is when you're bored of the standard, then you get bored of the reflective, you can progress into what I call a transformative territory recognition. And a transformative territory recognition is we're using a lot of the harder to have conversations. You're talking about elements of commitment, deep commitment to reconciliation. You're also talking about what gets often gets missed out of the news in the media, uh, like stories of systemic oppression, institutional oppression, systemic racism, uh, the struggles that indigenous peoples are, are up against. And then what you end with is, when I do the territory acknowledgement, I mean to shed light on those issues, to educate the people when we are doing the territory acknowledgement that it's not superficial. It's my way of sharing you know, what some struggles are. And so what you're doing is you're creating a culture of learning. Um, because often, if we look back at our history, you know, those have been missing <laughs> contexts from the conversation so far. And I just offer that as a tool tip and a trick and a strategy. Um, so that's a little bit, I'm like looking at the time here, I know we're like a little bit behind time. Um, I'm gonna throw the floor over to you to see if any questions just yet. Anything, you know, nothing is off the table for discussion on questions that you might have for culturally safer event planning, uh, reconciliation event planning, or how to celebrate National Indigenous Peoples Day. Because I'm just kind of like talking now and I know I'm going off track and I'm just stalling. I'm trying to like <laughs> see if you're like, if somebody's gonna jump the gun and then like go for a question. Yes, thank you. When did it end? It ended in, okay, started 18. Yeah, I know, sorry. Yeah, late 18, I think it's like 1885. Do you know? Do you know? No? I think it was the 40s. Yeah. 40s, yes, close, very close. So over 50 years, it's either 1885 or 1886. Very close. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's 1885. Yeah, I think it was 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 the information being shared so freely so thank you so much yeah um, when it comes to June 21st we work in a field where we have a lot of different people in different countries who may not understand the history of our indigenous population may not know that they're on territories um, and then how do you integrate and acknowledge that day in like the most basic educational way as a settler who like it's not my story to tell necessarily, but it is my position to educate those who may not know. Mm -hmm. So what's like a respectful way to do that? Is that you get, do you get it from someone else's words? Do I make it up myself? Do I get it approved? Is there some way mm -hmm. to do it respectfully? Mm -hmm. There are some standardized ways, like you can pull those off the web really easy from, um, there is NIPD Day, National Indigenous Peoples Day does have a, a, a site uh, for all of Canada, a national site, you can pull for the purpose of what, why the day is important. You can use that, or you can discern your own context for which you are facilitating your event, and then you can bring it, make it a little bit more intimate, bring in local indigenous voices, peoples to really explain from their heart, their experience, their perspective, what it is. So it's scalable, right? One thing I always say in cultural safety work, indigenous engagement work, uh, decolonization work is it's not going to be perfect. It's a practice, not perfection. Um, and it's a hard pill for event planners to swallow, isn't it? <laughs> I kind of sense that. But I, as a teacher, I'm like, I'm driven by my sense of perfection too, right? It's like you're, it's control, right? Um, but cultural safety, and please know, 
with humility. Cultural safety, decolonization, reconciliation, not gonna be perfect. <laughs> Errors are gonna be made, mistakes are gonna be made, and that's okay. It's gonna be okay, right? As professionals, what we want are some firm ethics to stand on, right? At your guiding star will be your ethics for this work, right? And if you're ever corrected too, and I just offer this lightly and with humility as a tool, you can put in your tool belt. Um, if anybody ever does correct you, because you hold a lot of power. As event planners, you hold a lot of power, right? You control agenda, you control people, literally, and then you control what people are going to receive. That's a lot of power. And I've event planned like two times in my life. It's so stressful. <laughs> um, and so I know the, the, the anxiety and the fear that kind of goes along with that for making sure that your messaging, their tone, the feelings and the vibrations that your audience are walking away with is like you've done a good job as a host, right? But please know, and this is I offer as a tool, um, in our culture, in, uh, in many indigenous cultures, correction is a sign of respect is if anybody ever corrects you, it's not like, oh my God, like I just gotta have to go back to the cash bar and like just like drink that one away. <laughs> Cause that's what I would do. Um, so it's like, you know, um, having that resilience to be like, oh, cause in our, our culture, correction is a sign of respect because if somebody ever pulls you aside or pauses you or after something says, hey, this is how you say it, or hey, this is how I would do it, or this is how you should have done it. Um, you know, in our culture, it's a sign of respect because if it shows you that we care about you. Right? If we didn't care about you, we would let you walk out of that event and make the same mistake a million times over, right? But if an elder or a knowledge keeper or a community member comes in and says, hey, you know, just so you know, this is how you say that nation, this is how you, I should have done that event or welcome that chief, it's not like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, you know, that's where we want to go as professionals, like, do no wrong, do no harm. But please know, please, please know in our culture, if somebody does that, it's like holding that beautiful space in your heart and within your professional humility, say, wow. Thank you. <laughs> that shows me you care. Because <laughs> I literally could have walked out that door and did the same thing a million times over. But the fact that you g gave me a little bit of your time to offer me a lesson, thank you for that, right? That's how I would look at that. But I would really use the power that you have for National Indigenous Peoples Day. You can use the standard. Um, I always say reach for the low-hanging fruit. Doesn't always have to be perfect as what's available to you. Because you might not always have an elder or a local uh, community member. And then I always say too, depending on your own comfort level, because everything's scalable in reconciliation, um, if you're finding in your heart, you're like, nah, screw that, I just wanna make up my own and make my own way, that's possible for you too, if you feel the comfort and the readiness uh, to be able to do that. You know, what I think uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day is about, right? Because ultimately, from an authentic, probably my own experience, uh, perspective on what the day is, it's a pause. National Indigenous Peoples Day is a pause. Because let's be honest, you know, think back to your elementary school days. Think back to your secondary school days. How much opportunities did you have to learn about Indigenous people, history, culture, and contributions to the planet? If you did have any, you were really lucky. <laughs> I'm 36, I think. <laughs> so I came up through high school in like the early 2000s. And I went to a very, very prestigious, we went to a very prestigious school. Um, they prided themselves in being a very first class school. And I remember being in grade 10 social studies, and this was like my whole high school career. Uh, there was a whole page of indigenous history, culture, and content throughout five grades, right? Five grades, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, five grades. And so like that's nothing compared to the amount of content, right? Thankfully, in 2013, we threw out that curriculum, and now Indigenous knowledge, history, and content is taught from kindergarten all the way to grade 12. And I know parents in the audience, you're like, I know, my kid comes home and tells me everything. <laughs> right? Because we have elder, our elders that are going to classrooms. When 215 happened a year ago, right? teachers were teaching it. They paused and they taught it in the class, which is a beautiful moment of reconciliation. So our education system is doing quite well. And that tells me that the future is bright because when those children start to hold our spots, right, in, in these places, they're gonna come to this conversation well ahead of us, right? Uh, so that's the way I would look at it. National Indigenous Peoples Day, in my perspective, is a pause to celebrate and recognize Indigenous contributions to the planet. Because um, it's not just historical, right? Because we're not a thing of the past. We actually have a lot to contribute to contemporary issues today too. Um, global warming. I think global warming or the climate crisis is rather putting it lightly. <laughs> I would call it a climate catastrophe, but I'm dramatic. Um, and I say that because, you know, as indigenous peoples, we have ancient laws that can contribute to that if we were brought to those tables, right? And we have principles and values that we cannot break. 
when we're invited to those global platforms, right? But we're not at those tables. The same for uh, social justice, right? As indigenous peoples, we have loads of knowledge and wisdom, ancient knowledge and wisdom, 14,000 year old knowledge and wisdom that we can contribute to social justice in this country, equity in this country, but we're not at those tables. But one day we will be, right? And so that's the way I look at, at celebrating um, that. Because on the topic of doing territorial acknowledgement, you know, when you're honoring Coast Salish territory, for those of you who do that in your professional practice, um, I'll share a cultural teaching with you and then I'll zip it to see if there's more questions. Um, but when you're doing the Coast Salish um, territorial acknowledgement, um, to internalize briefly for just a portion, if you can internalize a portion of, of this teaching that I'm going to offer, um, our relationship to the land is not about a relationship between a human being to the land. Um, our relationship in our mind and our, our mentality and our identity is that we are human beings of the land. Just think about that for a moment. Human beings of the land. Because that means that we are nothing without the land. That's ultimately what, what we're, we're saying. And the teaching behind that is that I will offer is, you know, we, let's say, 3,000 years ago, before contact, right? Um, traditionally, we did not bury our dead six feet in the ground when our relatives transitioned onto the spirit world. We didn't do that. That's a colonial practice that came over from Europe and taught to us. We didn't bury our loved ones six feet under the, in the ground. When our loved ones passed away, what we'd actually do with them is we would wrap them in either cedar cloth or cedar in the fetal position, because we come into the world in the fetal position, and then when they transition, we put them back into the fetal position, wrap them in cedar, and then hang our loved ones in, in sacred areas in cedar trees, in sacred parts of our territory. And then over time, their remains would go back into the ground. You know, the bones and the organs and the tissues, all of those ligaments, those will all go back to Mother Earth, right? Because the teaching is we all come from Mother Earth and one day we will all go back to Mother Earth, right? So after centuries and centuries and centuries of this cultural practice, every square inch of our territory, you are walking on our ancestors. You are walking on our family, right? So when you see us out there, you know, marching and protesting and demonstrating, you know, think for a moment what you would do to protect your parents. Think for a moment what you would do to protect your grandparents, your great-grandparents, right? So when you see us out there marching and protesting and demonstrating, we're not just protecting land, we're protecting our ancestors, right? Our ancient, ancient, ancient bloodlines. That's the beauty of our relationship to land. Now, imagine this. What if we taught this beautiful relationship that a human being can have with land from kindergarten to post-secondary for every Canadian citizen that is a student today. And we taught that from kindergarten to grade 12. We taught our students how, what a beautiful relationship you can have to land. Imagine when they become, you know, they grow up and they graduate and they become the next Premier John Horgan, the next Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, or the next CEO of a major energy company or corporation. How drastically different would our response to the climate catastrophe be, right? That's the rich contributions we have as Indigenous peoples if we were brought to the table, right? So I offer that as a cultural teaching. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, um, you mentioned that the curriculum, curriculum has changed. Mm -hmm. Is that just the BC or is that Canada-wide? BC. Yeah, so that happened in 2013, 2014, 2015. It was a scalable um, event yeah. because it used to be concentrated to grade four, grade 10, and then if your school <laughs> would have the audacity, um, you would implement the grade 12, um, First Nations Peoples 12 um, as an elective. Right, yeah, because I think we're of the same age-ish, um, and <laughs> might be a little older than you. But um, like, I was, like when you mentioned, like, I don't, if you don't even, like, I don't even remember any, like, uh, indigenous. Yeah. I mean, like I grew up here in Vancouver and like we went to like outdoor school, which is in Squamish Nation. And like, uh, I think it was like a long house for grade four or something, but like that's kind of it. So yeah. it's nice to know. I mean, I would like it to be Canadian wide, but mm -hmm. it's nice to know 
Yeah. Full transparency, um, I've traveled the province. I mean, from the comfort of my living room in the time of Zoom, <laughs> but spoken all across North America in the last two years over, over COVID because it made conversations like this so much more accessible for teams and organizations. And I think we're a little bit more progressive here in BC with a lot of different things. Um, and anti-racism work, multiculturalism work, LGBTQ2 stuff, like we're way ahead of, of a lot of parts of, of the province. And so I really commend, and that has a tremendous ripple effect. I mean, I'm already seeing the benefits of it because I teach at UBC. I don't know which direction, <laughs> uh, or why I would I even do that? <laughs> um, I teach at UBC and I teach uh, resident doctors. Uh, not resident doctors, they're first year med students, right? And they're like 20 years old, they're like 21 years old. So they had a whole chunk of that curriculum, right? And normally I teach doctors and physicians who are in older generations. And I ask, you know, I do pull of the room, like, okay, show of hands, how many of you know about the residential school, right? One person puts their hand up in 50, right? Uh, 60 scoop, Paul Latch ban, um, the for, uh, when it was illegal for us to hire a lawyer in a suit against the federal government, right? Nobody puts up their hand. I'm like, okay. Um, but then I go and do that same poll with, you know, those uh, first year med students, like 100% of the time I'm asking questions, like everybody knows it. I'm like, oh wow, I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna teach you. <laughs> <laughs> and then what they're telling me is like that curriculum is paying off, that curriculum transformation, because they're in the know, right? They're in the know. And so I'm like, I can't wait until you come become a doctor and like we can work together and, and those kinds of things. So in that regard, this, this work is really motivational to my, in my mind, this work is really inspirational. Um, super motivating, yeah, yeah, yes? To that point, as a room of people that probably missed that curriculum, what can we do to catch up on what those students are learning now? Mm -hmm. like, is there anywhere we can start? Yes, absolutely. There's some really great resources that coming resources that are coming out now. Uh, one is I don't know if anybody's heard of it. Um, the University of Alberta yeah. has a course. Yes, um, has a, a, I think it's called a MOOC, massive open online course mm -hmm. that you can take. I hear it takes up to six six weeks to take. Um, and all on, online self study uh, and what you do is it catches you up. I think it's called Indigenous Canada and it catches you up on our historical timeline. So you'll know all about the 60 scoop residential schools, uh, smallpox, all of those things. It brings you right up to speed and kind of fills in those gaps in, in our awareness. It's one minute. Is it? You have taken it? Have you done it? Okay. And I've heard that from quite a few people too is, is they've taken other cultural safety like shorter courses, but this one's quite thorough. So I mean, I'm not taking it myself, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good question. The residential school um, week was tough, but I went back. But yeah, it was great. Yeah. Worth yeah. It. yeah. There's also um, circles of reconciliation. It's mm. open, like, the um, Human Rights Museum in, in Manitoba, and they pair five or six non-Indigenous with five or six Indigenous members, and you go over a course of eight weeks and meet weekly for like an hour just conversation. It's really lovely. Hmm. Uh, another great online uh, learning resource where on your own time you can archive uh, uh, recorded lectures or rec recorded seminars is UBC has a learning circle. If you just Google UBC learning circle, um, a whole bunch of webinars will come up featuring Indigenous voices um, like myself and, and scholars, activists, traditional knowledge keepers, elders, and they get a whole hour to an hour and a half to just share knowledge and, and, and wisdom. Um, really great learning resource because I, I write curriculum uh, as, as a part of my, my consulting company. And so sometimes I'm like, I have a lot of questions. I'm like, I literally researched it on UBC Learning because it's a wealth of knowledge too. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Towards the learning and reconciliation in the events that we're doing. So besides the territorial acknowledgement, you know, what else could we do? Bring to events because we have some international events, we have local events. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So I think that the first thing that kind of comes to mind that I would offer, I would invite people to walk away with, is a thing called uh, a thing called a thing I call cultural advocacy. Uh, so advocating for Indigenous representation, inclusivity, and representation at all events. Um, and not just Indigenous representation in the sense that, you know, to have an indig Indigenous person holding the mic, 
um, doing a welcome or a territory acknowledgement, but how can you get into the deeper roots of what makes an event tick? Whether it's an event planning, event uh, post uh, evaluation or assessment, um, a screen or performance, you know, how, what is your, almost what is your SWOT analysis, right? What are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities to embed uh, reconciliation and indigenous um, inclusivity into your work? Um, and there's some, some ways that you can mobilize that and exercise that and own that because you don't just want to rely on the labor and, and knowledge of Indigenous peoples. We want to be able to lean in to this safely um, with uh, balance and in a good way. Uh, a way you can do that is if you belong to committees or you have an opportunity to strike a committee that is grassroots, you know, then you can be very democratic about it. Right? And your intention would be like, okay, hey, I'm going to start this committee, and it's how to transform some of our events and our event planning and the spaces we hold as event planners um, to decolonize or have a reconciliation at the core of our values. Right? We don't know what that's going to look like or sound like because it's not been done yet, uh, in my mind. Right? And so, and, but you're the professionals, right? You know what your profession is. You know what your discipline is. You have everything you need, right? All you need is to come together and put it on the table for discussion and ask yourselves, how can we transform? How can we play, if we put reconciliation at the core of the work that we're doing here, what might that look like? What might that sound like? And that's the teaching of the elders. The teaching, the elders offer that all the time. They're like, no, just put it on the table for discussion. The, through discussion and dialogue, it will start to take care of itself. Then if you come up with some really good ideas, because hands down, I see 100 good, good ideas come up out of one meeting where people are like, I know we're going to do this committee thing, Len, but I don't think anybody's going to say a thing. And I'm like, OK, don't worry. We'll, we'll give it a go, right? Um, put the thing on the table for discussion. Everybody's got something to say. People have been thinking about it for a long time. And I'm like, see, they have like really good ideas. There's like 100 ideas that kind of came out of it. Um, and then once you had, have your list of gen ideas generated, you can mobilize it into an action plan or framework for event planning or guidelines for event planning, whatever it is. You have sheets, you have lists, right? Tick boxes that you gotta do. You can, whatever your, your manifest is, your manifesto or your charter is that guides your work for event planning, look at that. That's your skeleton, right? That's your framework that you kind of operate from. How can you embed this work uh, in there with your peers and colleagues and grassroots, you're owning that kind of work. Once you feel like you have a good idea, you have a proposal, then you want to it ticked off um, by an indigenous representative, um, preferably in events planning who kind of speaks your language and understands your world. Um, that's where I would bring in somebody to kind of have, to kind of vet it a little bit to say, are we on the right track, right? Um, with that good, those good intentions, right? We want to be transparent. We want to be intentional. We want to make sure that this is meaningful in, in our work. Was that helpful? Okay. No, absolutely. And I think that what I've learned after, because uh, so many intentions, uh, that's a, the intentions of a lot of professionals today, right? They're like, we don't want to be performative, and we don't want to be tick boxy, and we don't want to be superficial. Uh, nor do we want to appropriate, right? Because uh, that's another pitfall that we have to navigate too, right? And so I say the best way to mobilize that, the formula that I've been prescribed in any way that I haven't encountered any problems yet, um, is to kind of start with that grassroots and take a critical examination of what are your guide, what is your infrastructure, right? When you transform the infrastructure, that's not tokenistic, that's not superficial, that's the meat and bones of the skeleton of what guides your work, right? Um, so whether it's your policies, or your frameworks or your guidelines, whatever it is that guides your work, take a critical examination of that. That will give you a sound sense of the direction that you'll be going. Because then it's a less of an add-on, but it's a built-in. Yeah. Good question. Last call. <laughs> was, this, was this good? Was this OK? Was this helpful? I'm seeing nodding heads. OK. I'm way over time, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll hang out for a little bit longer. Uh, I'm going to go have another glass of wine with, <laughs> uh, and, and just stick around for a bit if you have any other questions or anything like that. Um, I would just like to say thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for uh, having me uh, hold a little bit of space and share just a little bit of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, everything I do, I don't have any action items for you. I don't have any calls to action. I don't have any demands. Everything I do in my professional practice for this work is an invitation. So you have an invitation you know, to join this work and to incorporate this into your professional practice, 
your journey uh, moving forward. So I raise my hands to each and every one of you and I say hi Tsepka, thank you for having me. Have a great evening.